Shumai, I'm Hannah. And I'm Charlotte. And welcome to the Purple Sector. So today we are joined by our lovely friend Will. Hi, uh, I'm Will, uh, and I'm going to say welcome to FP1, that's, that's, that's the meme at this point. But yeah, I run a channel called Formula Podcast One. Uh, it's an attempt at comedy, you know, I'll, I'll let you guys decide whether you think it's funny or not. But yeah, that's basically what I do. We will link, obviously, all his links in the description below. So who wants to kick us off? First point about the weekend. Well, quality, it happened, didn't it? Um... What is there to talk about? It was it well Ferrari, I guess, are the are the team that really kind of shocked everyone. Going even before Quali, looking at FP three, Sebastian Vettel P twenty. You know what has gone wrong now at Ferrari? Like yeah, we've known they've had a tough car this season, but this weekend, you know, it's a power track, and we knew they were going to struggle. But I don't think we expect them to struggle this this badly. You know, I think Ferrari are, are like the the F one equivalent to the Liberal Democrats in a way. You know, go back ten years, and they were they thought they were in power, but really you've got the Tories, or you, or you've got you know Red Bull and McLaren are actually up on top and winning. And now you got to now where they're just the laughing stock of of, of, of the grid. And it- I agree, it is very strange when you see like said being in p20 in a ferrari it's just you think back to like not even just like a year ago like two years ago he was still up there fighting in that ferrari and even last year like charles coming in and smashing it i didn't think that they were going to get out of q1 they shouldn't be in that position they should still be in q3 like up there fighting with the mercs and red bull i agree i think there's at one point where we all thought were some of their customer teams actually going to get ahead of them in qualifying and that's actually to be honest who I feel sorry for is the likes of Alfa Romeo and Haas because they're stuck with an engine that they basically weren't expecting to get. They were expecting to grasp the engine that Ferrari had had last year and had been so dominant. And we all kind of thought if they've got that engine, they'd have been further up. However, they're just getting, to be honest, thrown to the wolves at the moment. The video of Carlos in the race, it's like... This is why you shouldn't sign for a team before the season has started. Because he probably thought, oh, I'm like, anyone's going to sign for a Ferrari to say, I've driven for Ferrari, you know? Like, to see where they are right now, he is, like, you could tell, he's got regrets about signing that contract. I mean, had Carlos not taken it, it would have been seen at the time as a really bad move because Danny Rick really got that Ferrari seat and I was like, oh, Daniel's back in the top tier car. In reality, you know, we knew Ferrari's pace and testing wasn't particularly great but we just didn't realize how bad it really was uh and you know you just got a feel for him man i mean carlos is one of those drivers that deserves to be in the top car and you know he was he was snubbed by red bull and yeah and now he's just got this bad luck again he's just gonna be one of those drivers that kind of with the bad luck just seems to follow him and today as well couldn't even start the race you know getting that getting that early taste of ferrari power already so i think that leads on quite nicely to like hannah's point so speaking of Daniel, I think we all were quite happy to see his form and quality was, I'm going to say, the, some of the best I've seen it all year. So he qualified P4. Esteban Ocon was three tenths slower than him. He was lining up on the second row alongside Max Verstappen, which I'm not going to lie, gave me Baku flashbacks and I was very <laughs> nervous. But I think it's surprising that Renault seems to be showing a lot more pace. And I think... It's not a good thing. However, I don't necessarily think they're going to keep it up going into next season necessarily. And also going into the regulation changes, I still think Renault is going to be further behind. And that I think Daniel moving to McLaren has had the better idea there. And then going obviously into the race, the fact that Daniel managed to keep people, I was so happy. Although his battle with Max terrified me. And you can kind of tell with those drivers that have that level of like this, like full on respect for each other, it was like a move I think at Silverstone that Alex made on Kimmy, where Kimmy gives him just enough room. Dan and Max were kind of dueling out, going a little bit off the track, but always giving each other that much room that it doesn't end up in a collision. And I think that definitely shows the quality of the racer. And this was, I think, when his best ever points haul since they've come back as a constructor. It's the fourth. T- it's the second time in four races that Daniels finished fourth, and it's also given Renault their first fastest lap in a Grand Prix since Robert Kubica in Canada in 2010. So I think overall, a very positive race for Renault. Hopefully, they'll get a podium soon. I- I'm a Ricardo fan, so I was very happy with this weekend. You know, it's, you mentioned second P4 in a few races. Yeah, and this P4 was actually on merit. You know, y- you've got to think back at Silverstone. He was kind of 
gifted that by Sainz and uh, Bottas blowing up. Um, so, you know, that helped him out a little bit. But this time, he stayed in P4 pretty much the whole race and showed off some pretty good overtaking as well. There was one point where I thought he was going to get sorted up by Albon, but then Alex seemed to lose the pace a little bit and then Ocon didn't. Uh, he was okay today. He was still a fair bit off Daniel, but you know, he got the point at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, you mentioned Italy as well. And it's a track you wouldn't think, you know, Renault would do particularly well at, given the fact it's a, it's very much a power circuit. But look back to last year and they got their best result with Danny P4 and Hulkenberg. Was he P6? I can't remember. It was quite high up there. Um, and it was a good, you know, double points finish for them. So I'm really excited for next weekend. And I think, you know, Renault, they need it. Because at this point in the season, they've got to really get those points on McLaren especially and, and, and racing point too. When I saw on the last corner that Danny Rick was like 3.1 second away from Max, I was like, whoa, like if he had like one or two more laps, he would have, I think he would have caught up with him. And they said that uh, Max's last lap was like a 151, I think they said. And Daniel's was like a 148. So you could see that he was really going for it on that last lap, which is like, like, well, like good for him. And um, Ocon's, overtake on Alex on the last lap as well like so yeah I think they had a really good weekend and obviously being a McLaren fan I kind of want them to stay (laughs) stay back but it is really nice to see Daniel doing so well again because he is a class driver and I was gonna say the one thing though that does kind of surprise me more than I think is the fact that how far Ocon still seems to be off Ricardo if you think back a couple of years ago people were touting that Ocon was going to be the next big thing he was going to be in that Mercedes seat besides Lewis this is a, tied for his best ever career finish. However, he was 21 seconds behind Ricardo, And I just think Ocon does not seem to be keeping up as well as I thought he would. And it would be bo- bodes kind of well or not well for him going into next year with having Alonso as his teammate and having the likes of Grand Yuzhu and Christian Lungard hunting down that Renault seat. Is like Ocon maybe went to Renault thinking his long-term future might have been there now that Mercedes seem to have switch their focus more towards getting George Russell in the Mercedes seat. So I think Ocon needs to be very careful and needs to start putting in more strong performances and needs to beat Daniel. Because even though Daniel's leaving, if you lost to Daniel and then Alonso's in next year, I'm not going to lie, Alonso will wipe the floor with him, I think. The, the thing with Ocon, and I feel like we wouldn't be having this debate had he not been so close to getting the Mercedes seat this year, uh, or last year even. I think, you know, there was all that hype around. He'd spent a year outside the sport and everyone kind of felt, you know, he's been kind of hard done by here. He's one of the biggest talents on the grid, one of the biggest talents of the future. And then he's out of a drive because Lawrence Stroll came in and put his son in. Now, it, it, you, you're right. Alonso's coming in next year. And as long as he doesn't do what Schumacher did, which was come back and be a little bit subpar, he's going to wipe the floor with him. And the other driver that I think will be around in the market, and I said this in my race week today, Pierre Gasly, he's another French driver, and let's say he keeps his Alpha Tauri drive because I feel like that's the minimum he's going to get um, given his performances today and for the and earlier in the season. If he keeps that momentum going, Ocon's still being a bit subpar. Renault still want a French driver in there. Then Gasly is a, a very good bet to go for if they want to keep with their trend and say we're going to have a junior program, but we're not going to actually put any of the juniors in our F1 team. So I think Ocon does need to like kind of step up the pace um, because next year everyone is going to be talking about Alonso because he is coming back. Like he, I might not like him that much, but he is a legend in the sport. Do you know what I mean? So I think he really does need to step it up. But yeah, Will, do you want to go on to your point? Quite an important yeah, so, point, I think, this one. Yeah, being yeah, a, a very interesting you know, human being in Formula 1 fan, I want to sit and talk about wheel tethers. Um, and that might sound boring, but if we look at the crash today that we saw between Antonio Giovinazzi and George Russell, you know, it's quite a slow section track. A track, piece of track we don't usually see much action or much in, instant either, you know. And Giovinazzi spins, spins off, hits the wall, bounces back across the track, and Russell collects the debris. Now... The bit that worries me here is the part of the debris that he collected was a loose wheel, you know, and it's not the first time we've seen that this year as well. Go back to, I think it was 2010, 2011, and people were asking, you know, these wheels are falling off the cars a little bit too much. And so they started adding these wheel tethers in, which for those who don't know, is basically like these um, 
uh, I think, I can't remember what they're made out of, maybe Kevlar or something, uh, a really strong um, material which basically connects the tyre to the chassis of the car. So if you're in an incident and that wheel breaks off, it's going to stay attached to the car. It's not going to go flying off into the crowd or into the path of another driver. In 2018, I want to say, it was fairly recent in the last few years, they've added a third wheel tether in. So there used to be one, then there was two, I think from 2011 onwards. And then from 2018, there was three. And basically that meant that the likelihood of these wheels coming off the cars was, you know, incredibly, incredibly rare. Because if one broke, you know, just one tether can hold the wheel on. So if one breaks, you've still got two more supporting it. Now, twice this year already, you had Kevin Magnussen's crash with Albon uh, at the British Grand Prix. Uh, we saw a tyre come off there and the entire wheel come off, bounced off into the gravel. No one really spoke about it. But now we've had Geo's rear wheel coming off and coming very close to hitting uh, George's halo. You know, if George was just a little bit more to the right, had, had he been on the normal racing line there, that would have hit him, uh, hit him flat on in the, middle of the, in the middle of the halo. And yeah, that's what the halo's for, but we shouldn't really need to be seeing it used in the first place, if that makes sense. So it, it does worry me a little bit. I think it's something that hasn't been spoken about enough, and I'm not seeing spoken about enough either. And it's something that Pirelli or the OF1, someone needs to look into it because there's something going on there. I don't know what it is because I, I, you could, the only real link between Alfred and Haas, they've both got Ferrari engines and I can't see that being the defining factor as to why the wheels keep falling off. But there's something going on there and it's something that needs to be talked about because, yes, it's been quite a few years since we saw a scary accident with a wheel hitting someone, but it has happened in the past and you know it could very easily happen again. When I saw whatever happened, my heart actually just sank to the bottom of my stomach because obviously last year and just it's just scary to see two cars crash like that. I know I know George didn't actually hit Geo and a Geo didn't actually hit George, but like it could have been so bad. And then when I saw the onboard of that wheel just flying towards George, I was just thinking, Thank God that halo is like there. Cause it could have been, it just could have been so much worse and the fact that it has happened twice now is is it is worrying because it's like if this is me- if this is meant to have three of them tethers on it why why are they falling off so like so bad yeah i agree i think the ties have increasingly been the thing to do with safety that i think get overlooked like we've had systems of like the halo in the past couple of years but tires seem to be the one thing that no one ever really focuses on so you've obviously had the situation where if the tyres completely come off. You also have the thing of a lot of the teams trying to do quicker and quicker pit stops. And when they're bolting on the tyres, and if you look what happened with Kimmy, and also additionally, if you look say back to Silverstone, is the tyre pressure's blowing. I think the FIA need to have a look at the way that they do tyres, either whether they put mandatory pit stops in, put more tethers on the tyres, and also making sure that the teams stick to certain rules around them. Because... The terrible thing is, is it only takes one of them to blow or that tire to ping off. If that was going up a rouge, we could have had a really, really serious accident. And I dread to think of what could happen just because the FIA won't do anything about it. And even if they think it's quite minuscule, is it's that minuscule thing that could be the difference between someone getting a serious accident or being able to actually get out of the way safely? Yeah, okay, the halo protects the drivers, but... You know, we, I think we're forgetting the fact that usually in a normal situation, we'd have fans at the circuit. And that tyre, with a bunch of, even if it's not just a tyre, but all the carbon and stuff that's still sticking out of it from the suspension, that goes into the crowd. The FIA aren't going to say the crowd have to have mandatory halos on their hats. And that's, that's not going to work, is it? You've got to actually fix the problem on, on a whole and fix the cars, you know? Um, all, all, all jokes aside, this could, can't, you know, this could spiral into something very, very serious if we end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, you know, it's something that needs, you know, we've seen the halo. Okay, yeah, it's, it, it, it's improved the safety a lot in F1, but it doesn't make drivers invincible. You know, I think this weekend is a, is a very serious and poignant reminder of that. So we've got to really look into it and, yeah, just someone needs to figure out what's going on there because there is, there is something up. So in terms of race points, I know you've got one, Charlotte, that you really want to talk about. We couldn't do this race review without talking about Pierre this weekend. Um, I think, obviously, we are all still trying to think of, like, 
I don't even know, comprehend what happened last year. And the tributes for Antoine this weekend have been absolutely amazing. And it's, I think it's so important to just talk about Pierre, like seeing them photos on, I think it was Thursday or Friday when he was walking the track walk and he went over to the spot and laid the flowers. And I just think he has performed so well this weekend, considering the circumstances. Is um, he qualified P12, finished what P8 this weekend? Um, like that move against Perez going up, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was so scared. I thought this is going to end in an accident. I thought he's getting so close to that wall, but he stuck it out, got that, uh, got that place, and then obviously he pitted because he was on the hard tyres, and he worked his way up back up to eighth. And I just think, like, just this weekend he's just done so well like considering the circumstances and yeah I think he's continuing to show us just how good of a driver he actually is and in that video before the race when he was talking about how Antoine messaged him saying prove them wrong I just think this weekend he just really did it for Antoine and Antoine's family and Pierre's and his friends and yeah I think he did a really good job this weekend and just want to praise him for it really. He he's been through a lot in, in 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 the last twelve months. You know, go back a year ago, he'd just been dropped from Red Bull, and then you know everything that happened at Spa, you know, occurred. And despite that, he put on he put in. Go back just last year. Given the circumstances, he put in a stellar performance in his first race back in in, in Toro Rosso at the time. And you know, he's just gone from strength to strength. You know, getting onto the podium at the end of that year in Brazil. And then, you know, this year where he's just been one of the best drivers on the grid and really shown that he deserves another chance in a top team. And, you know, I think if he doesn't end up in the top team again, it would be criminal. Because you know, like if you look at Perez, say, for example, who's the other driver, I guess you kind of consider it in, in that kind of bracket, who they're at a top team, they got dropped. You know, Perez is pretty good. He's fairly consistent. But if you look, at, if you compare his performances in the last few years to, to Gasly's this year. Gasly's just so much more consistent and consistently up there in a car which is, yeah, in a very competitive midfield. You know, let's be honest, you've got Renault, you've got McLaren, you've got Racing Point, all of there. Now for Tauri, the guys that have kind of been, they're kind of bridging the gap between, you know, your, your, your Alfa Romeos and your Williams and your, and the rest of that midfield. So he's outperforming that car, doing absolute bits with it. And, on a weekend like this weekend where you know the the feeling and the and the sorrow from last year is still very much apparent very much in the air that like he's gone out and done what he did and making that move around Eau Rouge which was of course the, the scene of, of the accident last year again just shows it's it's you know there's some guts there yeah I think Pierre shows that level of emotional resilience to me that both shocks and astounds me and I think that very few people like I do not honestly know how those drivers in Formula 2 in Formula 3 and in Formula 1 got on the grid this weekend I couldn't have done it I think to go out there to put on a show to do what you do best for the love of your sport has a level of courage that just astounds me and I think Pierre has had obviously as you said a rough year and Red Bull very much was a poison chalice he in reality shouldn't have been promoted when he was. If Daniel hadn't left to go to Renault, Pierre would have got at least another year in Alpha Tauri, if not two, and then eventually been re- promoted to Red Bull because I saw how good he was in GP2. I knew kind of a Red Bull seat was inevitable. However, I didn't expect him to get it when he did. And because of the Daniel situation, he had to get thrown into a team that Max was very much top dog of. No one can challenge Max in that Red Bull now. He is just supreme level of dominance and kind of in a very strong psychological position within the team but Pierre to go out there in Alfa Tauri that I think support him nurture him Franz Toss is I would not say Franz Toss is nowhere near like Christian Horner and Helmut Marco he kind of gives the drivers the ability to do what they do best and go and race and this tribute stuff brought me to tears I think it is an emotional weekend for all of them it's something that for many of them, this is probably the first kind of time they've dealt with a loss like that. If you think back into the days of Moss, of um, Stuart, of Clark, death was common. 
you would go a season with three or four drivers being killed. A lot of the times drivers would lose their teammates mid-season and things like that. However, now it's become a lot of safety has got a lot better. However, death is still something that can't be avoided. Accidents will happen on track. And no matter what you do, no matter how, how much safety that safety levels there are in place, there's a certain level of circumstance of sometimes something is just going to go wrong. And for them drivers, especially Pierre, to go out there to do what they do, just is incredible. And I think people always say, oh, racing these days is so much easier than it was in the 50s and 60s. No, it's not. It's a very different animal. And to have that level of courage should be commended. And I think to see him get driver of the day was just so heartwarming. And I think to Pierre, hopefully, is this weekend kind of his doing so well and getting eight is a tribute to Antoine and to the racer that we all knew should have been on that grid. Now, should we go on to our race predictions for Monza? Monza's going to be tricky, you know, and I'm, I'm going to be... I'm going to be adventurous for once. I could just go and say Hamilton bias for staff, but that's probably what it could, what it will be. But let's go Hamilton, Bottas, Ricardo. I think Renault are going to have a good weekend again, and I really want to see Cyril with a I lost Dan to McLaren on his forehead. <laughs> Is really that your race prediction or quality prediction? Uh, oh, that'll be my race prediction. Quality prediction. I'll go L- uh, Bottas. Lewis for Stapham. Lewis, Valtteri, Daniel, prediction for quali. Because if you look at last year, like Charles obviously got pole. Charles isn't going to be there. Sebastian was fourth. He's not going to be He's there. He's not going to be there. <laughs> I'm betting they will not get out of Q1. Um, I do not think they'll get out of Q1. And I think... Um, I'm going to also say the McLarens might be up there as well. I think maybe... Fifth and sixth, one of them, probably, probably Lando. Um, in terms of the race, oh, I'm going to go Lewis and Valtteri Daniel for the race as well. And George, to get a point, please. <laughs> and I'm Williams. Sick, I'm sick and that tired monster. of every race weekend saying the same thing. <laughs> but somebody has to say it. I think, oh, I think Pierre will get in the top ten again. But I think Lewis, Valtteri. So... Quali, I think Lewis Valtteri, I'm going to say Alex. I'm just going to throw it out there, you know. He might might pull a blinder, who knows. Um, and then for the race, I'm going to say Lewis Valtteri. I'm going to say Alex. Just know, I'm praying for Alex to get on the podium. So we'll see you all again next time out in Monza. So hope you have a good week. Bye. Bye. See you later.